Good evening and welcome. Uh, welcome to the 2023 Peter Corney Lecture in Youth Ministry. My name is Graham Stanton. I'm a lecturer in Practical Theology and Director of the Ridley Centre for Children's and Youth Ministry. It's a great pleasure and privilege to welcome you uh, tonight, uh, both here in the room and uh, joining us online. Um, look forward to this time that we, uh, that we have together. The Peter Corney Lecture in Youth Ministry is named for Peter Corney, one of, I think, the only public lecture we have at uh, Ridley named after a living person, uh, but a person who is unwell tonight. So Peter did ring earlier today and uh, sends his apologies that he's not able to join us, uh, but he did say he is 85. Um, uh, and I said, you know, we, we actually do need him, so uh, I asked that he would rest well. But uh, he sends his greetings and, uh, and particularly to, uh, to Ruth. And he shared the story. He said that uh, the first youth ministry, church-based youth ministry that he was ever involved in was a Christian Endeavour group uh, in Bunbury in Western Australia um, in the uh, early 1960s. He had come uh, to faith through uh, Crusaders, uh, at school and then had a friend who went to the Methodist Church in Bunbury and invited him to come to the, Christ, uh, um, the um, Christian Endeavour group and, uh, and that was his first uh, youth ministry. Uh, Peter, if you don't know, he then uh, moved uh, over east. Um, he first went to St Mark's Reservoir and then in 1965 became the uh, full-time youth pastor at St Hilary's Q. Uh, we understand, the, or certainly the first full-time youth minister here in the Diocese of Melbourne and at least among the first handful of uh, youth ministers here in Australia. Uh, from Q, he went and uh, became the first uh, diocesan director of youth ministry in 1967, uh, served there for some time, uh, got a little bit frustrated at the slow pace of things in the diocese. Um, no comment. Um, <laughs> Can't understand what sort of world he lived in, um, but uh, then um, uh, started his own uh, ministry training uh, organisation that uh, involved in all sorts of things around Melbourne. Um, and then in the early 80s, uh, initiated the Diploma of Youth Ministry program here at Ridley College. And so uh, we owe a lot uh, to Peter, and uh, it's uh, a great honour to have this lecture named in his uh, honour. It's also our honour and uh, uh, pleasure and privilege to have Dr. Ruth Lacabio uh, with us uh, today uh, from Sydney. Uh, Ruth is um, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, a former colleague of mine, and um, it's uh, wonderful that she can be uh, with us and we get to benefit from uh, her uh, insights uh, tonight. Uh, Ruth is easily the leading Australian historian of youth ministry. Um, I think she's also the second and third and fourth and fifth um, <laughs> most respected uh, historians of youth ministry in Australia. So it's a small club, but uh, a very important one, uh, but certainly among a very small handful of, uh, of people that are leading the historical study of youth ministry uh, globally. And uh, it's wonderful to have uh, her expertise applied to this area of ministry in our part of the world. Uh, Ruth, I'd love to uh, just... Um, interview you briefly just so that we can get to know you a little. Welcome. Sure. Great to have you in Melbourne. Um, uh, Ruth, tell us about your family in Sydney. Who do you live with? Who's in the family? Sure. I am married to an Anglican minister, so Anglican uh, Al Cabio, and I have three adult children. One is married and I have two at home, so they're 23 and 21. I also have a nephew living with us as well. Mm. So he's just started uni and living with us too. We have a terrible dog who's very old and incontinent. Oh. <laughs> hey, that, that's, that, that took a turn. That took a turn. Uh, <laughs> let's move on. Tell us, about, uh, tell us about your ministry role at YouthWorks College. What, what does YouthWorks College do? What do you do in the college? YouthWorks College trains kids and youth ministers uh, and we've been doing vocational ministry for over 20 years. So Graham has actually been the principal, the founding principal of YouthWorks College and all our lectures, even the New Testament or theology lectures really come down to then landing in kids and youth ministry. So we might do an Old Testament lecture and then think about, okay, how do we teach kids and youth about Old Testament or different topics. Um, so we have a handful, maybe 30 students 
that uh, hope to go into vocational kids or youth ministry. Oh, sorry, I teach church history and I'm the Dean of Women. Excellent. And church? Go to an inner west church in Sydney and I, uh, I pastor a year 10 group there. So year 10 girls and guys, um, who about eight of them who are trying to work out what does it look like for me to be a Christian at this stage of life um, because it's a bit of a turning point, year 10. So wonderful. Thank you, Ruth. Um, as you came in, there was this uh, handout that um, uh, Ruth will be uh, referring to at some point. If you are more electronically minded, then um, uh, you can scan that QR code and you can get a soft copy of it. I'm going to pray for us and for Ruth, and then we will be underway. I feel a little bit like everybody's taking a photo of me, <laughs> <clears throat> which is sort of exciting. Uh, <laughs> let me pray. God, our Father, we thank you for those who have gone before us, upon whose shoulders uh, we stand, uh, who are part of the great cloud of witness. Uh, we thank you that we uh, are beneficiaries of their faith and faithfulness. Uh, and we thank you that you have given uh, to us servants uh, like Ruth, uh, students of history and teachers of history. So we pray that tonight uh, we would uh, learn, we would grow, we would be shaped uh, by you, uh, by your spirit at work in and through us. Uh, please bless Ruth as uh, she shares with us. Uh, bless us as we listen. Uh, may we be um, strengthened for our uh, life and ministry and our service among uh, young people as a result of our time together tonight. Pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Ruth's going to speak for 25, 30, 40 minutes, something like that. Um, uh, we'll have some time for questions, so please uh, uh, write those questions down, uh, think about them as we go. Uh, and um, We'll deal with that until you're done. We're in your hands. Thank you. Uh, welcome, uh, everybody, for coming tonight, and thank you so much for having me. Like, it's a great honour um, to speak about <clears throat> the history of kids and youth ministry, and I'm really excited to be talking about it. Um, the topic for tonight's talk is Lessons from Christian Endeavour, a training school for the church. Now, why are we looking at this obscure kids and youth ministry uh, from the late 19th century to the early 20th century? There were, if you don't know, at one stage, 4 million Christian Endeavour members in the world. Um, in Australia, 1905, there were 75,000 members. That is one out of 40 people in Australia were members of Christian Endeavour. So Christian Endeavour is easily the biggest youth organisation that Australia has ever seen. But today, very few people, especially in the Anglican sphere, have heard of it. And there are very few Christian Endeavour societies in Australia now. My husband, actually, when I tell, told him, I'm talking about, I'm researching Christian Endeavour, he said, what's Christian Endeavour? So the fact that it was so large, so big, and now we know nothing about it is, is, is surprising. And it makes me think, oh, what was it about? Um, who was in it and how, how did we benefit from it? So we're going to look at lessons. What can we learn from Christian Endeavour? I always want my history to be practical. Uh, what does it mean for us today? And as I go on, please write down your questions uh, because we might, I might lean towards history um, I'd really love you to think about, you know, so what? What kind of applications or thoughts might help me in my youth ministry? So, lessons from Christian Endeavour. <clears throat> the lecture tonight is going to be divided into four parts. So just to tell you where we're going, I'm going to tell you about the founder, Francis Clark, and the origin of Christian Endeavour. I'm going to talk about the idea of training youth. I'm going to speak about the formation of Christian Endeavour in Australia and what methods were used. And then finally, we're going to think about lessons today. So first of all, the origin story. 
Uh, we all love a good origin, or, origin story. Origin, origin story, don't we? We hear uh, a great story and there's a great character in a movie and we, we want to know where they came from. So what was the story that makes them who they are? And one example that I thought of, you might think of some better ones, was from the X-Men movies. And finally you think, what, Wolverine, where did he come from? What makes him Wolverine? And then they made X-Men Origins, Wolverine. Just to find out where did he come from, who is he? This idea of an origin story, I think is really, I always wanna know um, how did this come about? What's the origin? That's why even though I'm talking about Australia, I wanna go back to Francis Clark. The origin of Christian Deva was repeated by Francis Clark repeatedly. He loved talking about the origin. He wrote about it in books, in magazines, in manuals, in pamphlets and speeches. Basically, every time he spoke, almost every time he spoke, he, talk about, he talked about how Christian Endeavor began, the origin story. He said that these writings about Christian Endeavor were silent missionaries. So as the writings went out, they'd actually inform people about the society and eventually Christian Endeavor would spread throughout all the world. So let me tell you about Francis Clark. He was an American congregational minister in Portland, Maine. He was there from 1876 to 1883, and that is him and his church. He believed that there was a youth problem in the churches. That is, young people were finishing Sunday school at the age of 14, but then there was kind of a gap between that and becoming adult members in the church. And the problem is that a lot of them were dropping out of church. There was nothing for them at church and they didn't feel able to just join in the congregation as adults. And Clark believed that many pastors <clears throat> needed to bridge that gap between Sunday school and adult church. He said that lots of pastors had tried to bridge that gap and they'd experimented, experimented with different ways to attract people back to church. The most common way of the pastors was to hold entertaining events. So this is a quote from Clark. That was the era of church entertainments and religious amusement. Pink teas and yellow teas and Russian teas and teas of all color and nationality were in full swing. I don't know why they're obsessed with tea. <laughs> they must have had lots of tea parties. Um, remember, this is the end of the 19th century, so perhaps there's not many other options. But they, churches also hosted tennis matches and they had um, musical soirees that was very popular, um, kind of like a talent quest. They had summer picnics and lots of other social events. So the churches were trying to entertain and attract young people in different ways. But Clark said the problem with these entertainments was that they were really failing to bridge that gap. They didn't increase church membership. So the young people would come along to the tea party, but then not become a member of church. And they also failed to strengthen the faith of young people. So Clark was grappling with these issues. How do we bridge this gap? <clears throat> in his church in January 1881, he led a week of prayer in his church. And to his absolute joy, there were 30 to 40 young people who became Christians. But again, how is he going to help them become adult Christians and help them to become members of a church? He was really afraid that when their enthusiasm died down, when their strong sense of conviction died down, that they were just going to drift away, lured by what he said are the entertainments. So he really um, decided that he wanted to do something new. And he, he pondered, how shall this band be trained? How shall they be put to work? 
how shall they be fitted for church membership? So to find out what they should do, he gathered 57 young people from his church, young men and young women. The ages were between 10 and 18. He talked to them about the, his idea, which was to establish a society. He wanted to have a society of endeavour, to help the young people endeavour to live a Christian life to grow in spiritual maturity and to serve the church. He framed it as a discussion, you know, come to my lounge room, let's have a talk about what we can do. But in fact, he already had a constitution and <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> so here is the constitution. Uh, I think he was kind of had a journalist background, so he kept everything, right? Um, this is the constitution of the Williston Young People's Society of Christian Endeavour. You've got the object there to promote that. You probably can't read it, but to promote the earnest Christian life among its members, to increase their mutual acquaintance, and to make them more useful in the service of God. That was the object of his society. Membership. The members of this society shall consist of all young men and young women who sincerely desire to the results above specified. They shall become, it's, it's very business language, isn't it? They shall become members upon being elected by the society and signing their names in, the, in this book. In the constitution, Clark also said the society was to have a prayer meeting um, every week and a consecration service once a month which we'll come back to what a consecration service is. He said in the constitution, it is expected that all the active members of this society will be present at every meeting, unless detained by absolute necessity, and that each would take some part, however slight, in every meeting. So that's interesting in itself, isn't it? That every person in the group was to play some little part in the meeting. The society was to be run by a young person. So a young person was to be elected the president and they elected an executive committee and many other committees so that, again, every member would be put to work. Now, the young people in that lounge room in Clark's house kind of balked at this high level of commitment. Could they commit to be there every single week? Could they commit to this? Um, consecration service every month, and this sort of high commitment of striving to live a holy Christian life. So they took a bit of convincing to, to sign the constitution. Even Mrs. Clark, she was in the kitchen apparently baking some cookies. She burnt the cookies because <laughs> she could overhear it and she thought, what are you doing? This, this expectation is too high. But Clark finally uh, got them on side and they all signed the constitution and formed the first Young People's Society of Christian Endeavour. Now, what did Clark do? He is like a journalist. So he writes up the story, his story of the formation, the origin story of Christian Endeavour, his society. He puts it in a congregational newspaper and hears back from lots of pastors. They're really interested in this new, exciting idea. So Clark decides to write other things. He starts to write a book. Eventually, he writes lots of articles, pamphlets, books about the origin of Christian endeavour. He really publicises the origin and the model of this new ministry of a society. Uh, Clark very soon included in the Constitution a pledge. Um, he wanted that pledge because he wanted every young person to become an active member of the society. To do so, they had to make this pledge publicly. So the original pledge said, trusting in the Lord Jesus for strength, I promise him that I will strive to do whatever he would have me do, that I'll read the Bible and pray to him every day, and that just as far as I know how, Throughout my whole life, I will endeavour 
to lead a Christian life. As an active member of this society, I promise to be true to all my duties, to be present and to take some part, aside from the singing, in every meeting, unless hindered by some reason, which I can conscientiously give to my Lord and Master. If obliged to be absent from the monthly consecration meeting, I will, if, if possible, send an excuse for my absence to the society. It's a very institutional, isn't it? Well, lots of pastors are really excited by this new idea, by the constitution, by the pledge, and Christian, uh, Christian Endeavour Society has quickly spread, first of all, through the US and then to different countries around the world. So the first was actually Hawaii, China, um, then it spread to Canada, UK, India, South Africa, and Australia. They all adopted the constitution and the pledge. And so this model, this new model of exciting ministry got going. Now, oops, training. Um, Clark's model was all about training. So we've called this lecture um, the training school for the church. That is that Christian Endeavour could be a place where young people were taught and could actually not just be given instruction, but also practice living out the Christian life. They were to be trained in service and trained to be effective Christians. Now, we may or may not like the word training. <clears throat> we might even call it discipleship, I think, because it's the same kind of idea. It's, I think, training a young person is walking alongside them. That's what Clark meant. Working, walking alongside younger Christians, instructing them, but also helping them to live a life of service, helping them to showing them what it means to live an earnest Christian life. Now, why was Clark all on about training? It was a problem of retention, which was his original uh, problem that he talked about. <clears throat> He was concerned about the number of young people who are leaving the church and what that would mean for the church of the future. Was the church just going to die? His priority, therefore, was retention of young people, not outreach. And he said it was partly um, because there was so much focus at, the, at that time on revivalism. So people that you might have heard of, like J.R. Moody and Charles Finney, were doing their tours of the US and in fact the world and preaching revival sermons so that their hearers would be converted. Instead, Clark believed that the survival of the church wouldn't come through revivals, but, um, but through nurture, the training and nurture of young people. He believed the survival of the church was dependent on the children of Christian families. And he said true kingdom growth would be growth from within rather than conquest from without. He said the way to, re, to, to retain them was to harness the energy and enthusiasm of youth, their passion, to point them towards earnestly pursuing holiness and service, and that this training would help them not be lured by the attractions and entertainments of the world, but will focus them instead on serving and loving the Lord. Nurture, Christian nurture. In Clark's writing, nurture was foundational to training. <laughs> he was really influenced by another congregational pastor, Horace, Bush, Horace Bushnell, who wrote Christian Nurture. In Clark's own book, his first book that he wrote, Children and the Church, he extensively quoted Bushnell. He was quoting him all the time. Bushnell had argued in this book that young people could be Christians from a very young age. He talked about, you know, even the age of four. So they can grow up with a Christian faith. And it was therefore the responsibility of families and churches to nurture that faith, um, to cultivate that faith and the affections of children to want to serve and love Jesus. Clark absolutely agreed with Bushnell. 
that a child coming from a Christian family does not need to have a crisis in their life or a conversion experience, but instead that they can grow up a Christian and never know himself as being otherwise. So they would never have a sense of being converted. They would always know and love Jesus and feel that they're a Christian. Clark gave ex examples from the Bible. So he talked about Samuel, Timothy, and even Jesus uh, never had to go through a conversion experience. They grew up in the faith. Clark's teaching was really shaped by Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. But he believed that parents and churches were not fulfilling their responsibilities to young people. They weren't nurturing and training their children. This led to a space for something else. If the church and the parents weren't doing it, then we needed another form of youth ministry. Um, and this is where the idea of our Christian Endeavour Society fitted in. Um, he believed there was a sad lack in the home training and the church training of, of young Christians. Christian Endeavour in Australia was formed really early, <clears throat> so only seven years after Clark's First Society. Uh, so it was formed in 1888 in Brisbane, for those Queensland people out there. Um, uh, a young man called George Colby, he sailed into Australia on his father's ship um, from Boston because of his health. So he wanted the nice, you know, warm air of Brisbane. Um, while he was there, he attended Wharf Street Baptist Church and he persuaded the pastor there to start a Christian Endeavour Society on a Monday night. So he'd experienced a Christian Endeavour Society back in the US. And so he had the first meeting. There were 25 young people who came to the society on Monday evening. They made the pledge. Um, the Colby and, Sir, and the minister wrote to Francis Clark and asked for help. Francis Clark wrote back, this is his letter. Not that I've seen it, but there's a copy um, of the letter. And um, the, the Brisbane minister had asked for some help. So he wanted a constitution, he wanted some pamphlets, some information about this new society. Francis Clark sent back all the literature, all the material that they needed, and the Christian Endeavour Society was, was helped and blessed by, by Clark. From this first little society in Brisbane, uh, they actually forwarded, Clark sent lots of literature, they forwarded the literature on to many other places in the state. And therefore, the idea of Christian Endeavour spread. It spread from church to church in Australia. And by 1890, Two years later, there was a Christian Endeavour Society in every state. Um, obviously, Francis Clark, it must have been close to his heart. He visited Australia in 1892 on his first world, to, world tour. And he really wanted to encourage and uh, spread the idea of Christian Endeavour. I think this visit in 1892 really illustrates the importance of this charismatic leader that Francis Clark was. He first of all sailed into Sydney and then he traveled to all the other major Australian cities. Um, the reason why I think Australia was so close to his heart was that 40 years later, one of his biographers called Chaplin, he had gone into Clark's house and he saw all this memorabilia in the house. Um, it included a rug made from a possum with all these possum tails on it, um, a streamer from the boat that Clark first sailed into Sydney Harbour, and an ink stand made from an emu's egg. Um, so, Christian Endeavour continued to, to grow in Australia after 1892, after the visit. That gave it a real boost, obviously, Clark's coming to Australia. 
it especially spread through the Congregational Baptist and Methodist churches. And uh, the growth of Christian endeavor in Australia was absolutely spectacular. For example, in 1904, Clark came to Australia again. This was another worldwide tour. He spoke at a Christian Endeavour conference at Sydney Town Hall, and there were 75,000 endeavourers who gathered from all over Australia in Sydney Town Hall. So lots of them travelled a long way. There's more evidence of the astounding growth of Christian Endeavour by J.B. Jackson who was the Honorary Secretary of the Christian Endeavour Union in Victoria. He also edited a Christian Endeavour magazine that they quickly got going. It was a, like a weekly newspaper called The Golden Link. My guess, I mean, this is just a guess and a hypothesis, that The Golden Link is the link between Sunday School and the church. Um, in 1892, he wrote about the success of Christian Endeavour in Victoria. And here's a little table for you to see how much it grew. Um, this is five years of Christian Endeavour in Victoria, going from 560 members to 16, a bit over 16,000 in five years. That's incredible growth, isn't it? Jackson proudly wrote, we have trained our members to definite and practical Christian service. The records of societies before us are in many instances astonishing, which I agree with. It has been said that we ask too much of our members, but the results show the church has hitherto asked too little of our young people because the Christian Endeavour Society is asked for a lot. So what were the methods of training, especially when it came to Australia? We have already seen the constitution, the objects, the pledge were very uh, significant to the first Christian society in, um, in meeting in Clark, and it was communicated to societies all over the world. And in Australia, we embraced all these methods. So first of all was the prayer meeting. The prayer meeting was the foundational activity in the society. Clark had written in his manual that all members should take some part in this prayer meeting. It could be something really, really easy. So it could be reading a Bible verse, or it could be a short little testimony of what God's been doing in your life. Um, it could be a short prayer, but something in that meeting that would edify the other people. Now, just remember the age of these young people. Uh, it was generally between the ages of 14 to 25 at this time. I love this quote by Clark. The society teaches that no Christian is too young, too inexperienced, too obscure, too bashful to make some genuine contribution to the life of the meeting. In Australia, this model was well uh, followed and I've given you there a story about the prayer meeting from Cuneoon. Cuneoon. Uh, any Queenslanders know where Cuneoon is? It, apparently it's a little rural place in Queensland. Um, they wrote this uh, pamphlet called The Review which is like funny things that happened in their society, little quotes and a story about their prayer meeting. Um, I think it's about 1920. It's not dated, but I think it's about 1920. Uh, that's a photocopy of it. Why it's called MICE is the Methodist Intermediate Christian Endeavour Society. So MICE. We were talking about cool names at dinner for youth groups. Well, he was one. Come to MICE on Tuesday night. <laughs> Um, we're not going to read out that, that photocopy, but, you know, if you get a bit bored while I'm talking, you can have a look at what a typical prayer meeting was like. Um, so first of all, there's a prayer meeting. Second, I've already mentioned the pledge. And what happened with the pledge in Australia? A member of the Cunion Society said this, it is essential that we have exercise so as to strengthen our physical bodies. 
We get this not necessarily by special training, but through our everyday work. So it is with the Christian life. We need exercise to strengthen our faith in God. The Christian Endeavour Pledge strengthens us and gives us something to think about in our daily toils. Can you get that sense of like the training, the effort, the everyday working on your Christian life? There's this idea, again, of endeavour, the Christian endeavour. So the pledge was a promise that the young people gave um, in their training to live a Christian life and to be committed to obedience. So they're in the methods of the Christian Endeavour Society. There's the prayer meeting, there's the pledge, and then we already talked about, well, I mentioned the consecration service. Um, in Clark's manual, he didn't only require you to be at the prayer meeting every week, he also required you to have a monthly consecration service. And at this consecration service, you would actually renew your pledge. The members at this service were asked to search their heart and to see whether they had been devoted to Jesus' will in the last month. So every month they had to think back um, on their, their heart, on their actions, and think about what they'd failed in um, and how to do better in the future. At the end of the consecration service, there was a roll call. So you'd say the names, make sure everybody was there. And every member was called to declare their allegiance to Christ. The question was, am I on the Lord's side? Do I serve the king? So you'd get up, Graham would say, I'd say Graham Stanton, he'd go up and he'd say, yes. <laughs> um, consecration was, is a really interesting word, isn't it? And it's a word that was really, um, we don't talk about it very much, but it was used a lot in Australia in the 19th and early 20th century. It was a word that came from the holiness movement. Um, so if you think about, you might have heard of the Keswick Convention back in the UK. It began in 1874 and influenced uh, Australian evangelical culture. It is where Contuma Convention comes from and also the Belgrave Heights Convention comes from. This movement, the holiness movement, emphasised sanctification and holiness by faith, they talked about. They really focused on progression in your Christian life and this sense that your holiness or Christian life grew through a series of crises um, or recommitting your life to Christ. And so consecration was a really big part of that. And even at these holiness conventions, so at you know Katoomba Christian Convention in Belgrave Heights, you might have a week of teaching, but one of those big nights was the consecration night where you'd hear teaching about consecration and then have an opportunity to step forward and rededicate your life to Christ. Uh, I think it's really reflected the idea of consecration in the hymn composed by Francis Ridley Havergal in 1874, which is not long before Christian Endeavour um, was formed. So one of the lines is, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Anyone want to sing that? You know, we probably still sing it today. <clears throat> so consecration was incredibly important and the consecration service. The other method was committees. In Clark's manuals and books and pamphlets that he sent over, um, he wrote that every active member should not just speak at the prayer meeting be there at the consecration meeting, but also they had to be in a committee. That was part of being a member. Um, this was to be for their training. So committees actually trained young people in important skills like being able to speak publicly, being able to pray publicly, to organise things, to give generously, and also to be a witness to others. All these committees, it was very institutional, all these committees had their own um, clear objects and a constitution, again. Um, they were run by a president, a vice president, and a secretary. <clears throat> they had to give a report to the executive committee of the Christian Endeavour Society. And even uh, members of the junior societies um, were expected to take part in a committee. 
1892. So on the World Wide Tour, Mrs. Clark came with Mr. Clark and she addressed the Australian Convention and said that even in the junior society, we needed to have uh, a president who was a child. And all those people on all the officers and committee members, again, should be children. In Australia, Jackson really affirmed this model of training through committees. He, there were three essential committees that Clark talked about. The Lookout Committee. Uh, the Lookout Committee was <clears throat> a committee that looked out for new members and tried to include them into the group, but also it was looking out for people, members who were not turning up, not turning up to the prayer meeting or the consecration meeting or, <laughs> or doing their duty on the committees. And in fact, the Lookout Committee could tell you to leave the society if you weren't fulfilling your duties. There was a lookout committee, there was a prayer meeting committee that organised the prayer meetings, and there was a social committee as well to organise social events. There were also other committees. Um, the committees just multiply um, depending on how big the group was. <clears throat> there were flower committees that could decorate the church and decorate the hall for Christian Endeavour uh, meetings. There was a missionary committee often that would raise funds for missionaries. And my personal favourite <clears throat> was the Sunshine Committee. Oh. <laughs> um, the Sunshine Committee brought good cheer. Good cheer. <laughs> and practical service. So if you're an encourager, an encouraging person, you might want to be on the Sunshine Committee. It could, it could include a nice encouraging note or a gift of flowers or a present, um, but also extended to uh, giving food and help and money to people in need. So here's a Sunshine Committee actually distributing food for soldiers um, at the wharf. So the committees are really important on top of the other uh, methods of Christian Endeavour, one of the key principles of Christian Endeavour and came through their committees was global mission. Um, here we go. Don't be super offended by <laughs> the photo on the right, but you can see different Christian Endeavour <laughs> members dressed up as different uh, nationalities. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of awkward, isn't it? Um, Clark was absolutely de delighted when he heard that societies had sprung up of their own accord in different parts of the world, including Australia, and he envisioned a global youth movement. <clears throat> I won't read out that poem. <laughs> you can read it on your own. Um, it goes on and on, but <laughs> um, I spared you <laughs> that. <laughs> um, uh, what, so Fra Francis Clark, he was hoping for a global movement. It was a mission in the sense that in different parts of the world, societies were planted and people from different nationalities would begin societies and join societies and attract newcomers and Christianize the world. Hence his world tours, um, hence his encouraging of societies in Australia and many other countries. This missionary and global view uh, was in Australia as well. So Jackson wrote with pride that the Victorian societies had raised up 10 missionaries and seven, the, seven of them were women. And this was as early as 1892. So, you know, Christian Endeavour has only been going four years until, you know, off it goes. Um, mission amongst Aboriginals. Aboriginal communities became a real focus of mission in Australia. Apparently the first mission was in 1891. Well, you know, that started off the sense of missionary call in 1891. A group of endeavourers went for a picnic at La Perouse, uh, which is in Sydney. They encountered there an Aboriginal camp when they were enjoying the beach and they came up and they saw an Aboriginal camp. Um, they were really moved by the way that these people lived in poverty and really felt a sense of uh, calling to speak to them about Christian faith. They kept on visiting 
So they met them once and they started to build up a relationship with these people in the community. And finally, they established a Christian Endeavour Society amongst that, in that camp. <coughs> in 1894, they raised funds to send a missionary to the camp called Miss Rita Dixon. Um, she had to originally live in a tent in the camp and because, and she conducted meetings inside the tent as well as, you know, slept and eat in her tent. <clears throat> she communicated to her supporters that her tent wasn't waterproof or waterproof. Um, and so they, again, conducted fundraising to try and build a mission house. Um, you can see the mission house in the photo and Miss Dixon is fourth from the left. Not that you can see it very well, but Miss Dixon is there. Now, Christian Endeavour was actually, I think, fantastic for Aboriginal communities. Uh, one of the leaders of the, one of the Aboriginal communities called David Unipon, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but something like that. Um, he loved the way it allowed each member to speak. So just like the white Christian Endeavour societies, um, they, each member had to speak in every prayer meeting. Um, each member had to be on a committee and each member had to go to the consecration service. And so they were, these young people were kind of empowered in these societies. Uh, Unipon said <clears throat> it made all the individual members co-workers with the ministers. And I love this. It was gratifying to see the members, first one, then the other, emerge from their shyness after being only able to read a verse of scripture or a hymn. They were able to take their part, however small in the meeting, and this was the best means of training them to become workers in the church. This first mission, led by Miss Dixon, led to missions in other parts of other states um, and other Aboriginal um, camps. It led to the United Aboriginals Mission, which has hence developed into the Ab Aboriginal Inland Mission, uh, which enabled young evangelical Christians to become missionaries to communities and actually still operates today. Uh, so it came from the Christian Endeavour movement. Um, Francis Clark visited the La Perouse community, by the way, and there is this terrible quote, which I left out because I was running out of time, which is incredibly patronising and frankly racist. Um, but despite Clark's views on Aboriginal communities, um, Christian Endeavour, I think, did a wonderful job um, amongst Aboriginal, empowering young Aboriginal men and women. <coughs> so conclusions and lessons for today. This is a Christian Endeavour march in Sydney in 1914. Christian Endeavour, as I said before, grew exponential, exponentially in Australia. But the numbers began to really decline in the 1940s. It was still going in the 1960s, particularly. So, you know, Fred Nile was the president of Christian Union in Australia at that time. Um, but I think the reasons for Christian Endeavour's rise can also give us insight into the decline of Christian Endeavour. First of all, as I said before, Christian Endeavour tried to bridge the gap between Sunday school and the church. But by the 1940s, <coughs> denominations had really taken over this role. So there were fellowship groups that had begun, there were denominational societies and denominational groups that took this place. Second, Christian Endeavour was inspired by the charismatic leadership of Francis Clark. He was a big man and he publicised the movement really well. But in 1927, he retired and there was a different uh, president. Third, uh, I think Christian Endeavour flourished in a common evangelical culture of holiness and piety. Um, there was uh, a unity in their, their out, outlook of longing for holiness rather than doctrinal differences. So um, Christianity was about, evangelical Christianity was about practical living uh, rather than the doctrines that we know. 
But in the 1920s, there was a real conflict between the fundamentalist evangelicals and liberal Christians. This is when it, that really began and the common evangelical unity began to break down. Um, so that the context where Christian Endeavour grew, that common evangelical um, outlook changed after the 1920s. Final reason I think it declined was by the 1940s, young Christians desired uh, a more relational um, organisational group. So as, you, as I explained, um, Christian Endeavour was very institutional with all these societies and constitutions and reports. Um, young people by the 1940s were, were much more psychologised. They wanted uh, relational organisations and relationships. They wanted it to be relational. So what are the lessons for today from Christian Endeavour? Many pastors in the late 19th century were concerned with the retention of young people in their churches. <clears throat> Is it any different today? Are there lots of pastors concerned with the young people dropping out of church? Yes, says Dave. <clears throat> Especially, you know, after the age of 14. In 2019, David Kinnaman of the Barna Group surveyed young Australians, most of them between the ages of 18 and 35, and 71% of the respondents were church dropouts. That is, they grew up Christians but no longer affiliated with church or identified as Christians. And only 30% remained as committed Christians. So... Young people had grown up in the church and then dropped out. Only 30% um, who had grown up in the church were still Christian believers. <clears throat> so how do we bridge the gap between being a Christian child and being an adult Christian uh, committed to church? What is the golden link? If only we knew. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. Um, <clears throat> What we know is what Clark said, that it's not by attracting people by tea parties um, or tennis or soirees or other entertainments. It just doesn't work. Um, Clark believed that youth could make a heartfelt commitment to Christ and the pledge would help them do this. So too would training, encouraging them in leadership, helping them participate and to do Christian service with each other and also in their communities. Uh, Brian Hull, who wrote A History of Christian Endeavour, he argued that many churches were good at instructing youth about scripture and the Christian life, but the missing link was an opportunity to live it out, to practice implementing it in everyday life. And I wonder if we are similar, that we might be good at instructing youth about scripture but we don't give them so much the opportunity to live it out, to give them opportunities to actually serve, to actually participate, to actually lead and organise. Brian Hull talks about a ministry with youth. Um, it's, it's, there is a sense where the older members of Christian Endeavour were discipling and training the younger members in how to live out the Christian life, how to, do, um, how to serve the church, and how to live an earnest life as a Christian. I want to encourage you to help our young people to participate, to develop their gifts in organisation, in if they have the gift of encouragement, um, you know, they can be part of the sunshine that spreads. Um, to share a meaningful verse, to pray, um, to give a testimony of God's goodness in their life. These principles from Christian Endeavour, I think, are still really valuable today. Uh, Francis Clark warned societies that older members and pastors talk too much. Does that still happen today? <laughs> Does the minister talk too much? Do the older members talk too much? Do we give more space to the younger people? We need to empower young people, even though we think, I can do the job so much better than them. Um, I'm much more efficient and I'm much more professional but allowing some space for that young people to actually uh, practice and live out, um, to take on some of those responsibilities and to grow. 
Secondly, ooh, whoops. Consecration. Um, the, the idea of consecration was really central to Christian endeavor and came straight from the holiness movement, as we've seen before. The idea of giving up your will for the will of God, to examine your heart and your actions um, and rededicate your life to, to the Lord. I think we fear that this idea of consecration or constantly rededicating yourself might lead to legalism or a, um, an unhealthy obsession with your own actions and motivations. But I wonder whether we've fallen into the danger of giving our young people a gospel of cheap grace um, and not calling them to holiness. I think it is a helpful thing to give moments for a young person to rededicate their life to Christ, even if they're already Christians. And in our ministries, I think we often find conferences or camps, confirmation, really great times of consecration. Um, being a Christian, I think, is going on a journey with Jesus and there's different turning points and different phases of life as you grow up where you have to rededicate yourself to Christ in this new experience of life. Um, I was thinking about myself as an Anglican and um, I think confession in our churches every week can be a form of rededication, of turning away from sin and accepting forgiveness, but then we are called each time in confession to live a holy life. So it's, it's a shame when kids are taken out of church and not experiencing or being part of confession. Um, because we need to train them in confessing their sins and rededicating themselves to the Lord. But are there other ways as well that we can give our children and youth uh, a consecration experience, a rededicating themselves? Finally, pledges. Um, what, you know, the idea of a pledge in a youth group seems really weird, but there are lots of other pledges. Can anyone think of any other pledges? The top of your head? Yeah. Prefix made a pledge. Yeah, yeah. What was that, sorry? The Scouts? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Do they still? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking to your marriage. <clears throat> if you're married, you make a pledge. Um, if you're ordained, you make a pledge. Um, there was a purity pledge as well in the US. <laughs> Not so good. <laughs> um, but a pledge. Uh, a pledge is really helpful, especially when you're struggling. I think you can look back, even if you're struggling as a Christian, and say, no, I made a pledge, I made a promise, a promise to God and a promise to myself. Um, and I will give an account to God for how I live my life. Um, when my husband, Alan, was a teenager, he read the book, uh, The Fight by John White. Has anyone read it? It's very old now. Um, it, it goes through the basic areas of Christian life and it's particularly written to a new Christian. So it talks about faith and prayer and temptation, evangelism, Bible study. <clears throat> and at the end of the book is a pledge. Uh, you needed to sign the last page to say that you would read the Bible and pray every day. Um, it's quite similar to the Christian Endeavour Pledge. When, I, when he told me, I thought, this is legalism, no way. Um, but actually he found it incredibly helpful when he read it as a teenager in taking his faith seriously. Um, another form of pledging I thought of is confirmation. Uh, when a confirmee, confirmee stands up and makes this pledge, um, his, they're asked, those who are to be baptised and confirmed must declare their allegiance to Christ. So there's that word of allegiance again. And their rejection of all that is evil, the devil and all his works, the empty display and false values of the world and the sinful desires of the flesh. Therefore, I ask you, do you turn to Christ? Do you repent of your sins? Do you renounce evil? Um, they're called upon to make a, kind of a pledge. Um, and it's a great blessing in many Christian person's life, that pledge. 
Are there more ways that we can encourage young people to make a pledge? And perhaps if you're not from the Anglican tradition, um, confirmation and confession not, might not be part of your um, church experience or rituals, but are there other ways that you can encourage young people to make this kind of promise, a promise to God and a promise to themselves? So they were the three uh, lessons that I wanted to bring you today. The um, retention of young people, thinking about how do we retain young people? What do we, can consecration be a helpful idea for us? And finally, the idea of pledging. How can we make use of pledging in our ministries? Christian Endeavour was a training school for the church. So I want to appeal to you to continue doing what the Christian Endeavour Society um, tried to do to nurture and train our children and youth so that they might remain in the church and earnestly seek to serve their Lord throughout their whole life to endeavour to lead a Christian life. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to say a few words uh, in uh, response of just uh, some things that, uh, that I really appreciated and some things that I'd love uh, to hear more from you about and things that just might spark a bit of a, a conversation among us. Uh, with the, the neglect of history, um, uh, I'm one of the problems. Um, uh, I got 51% in Australian church history uh, at, uh, at Theological College. I had to write an essay on the impact of the gold rush on the church in Australia. And I had one fact, that the gold rush meant people left the cities to go to the gold fields. And I constructed a whole essay around that. There were less people in churches in the cities because they'd gone to the gold fields. That affected the church. There were lots of people in churches on the gold fields. That affected the church. And that was about it. Um, uh, um, there are all sorts of reasons why we have a neglect of history. But I wonder whether the more significant question is, what are the consequences of our neglect of history? And of course, the consequence is that we lose the lessons of the past. But I think what you gave us tonight is the reminder that when we neglect our history, we lose the opportunity for thankfulness and for inspiration. Uh, I don't know about you, but my heart swelled when I saw the constitution of that first Christian society or, or, or um, young people's society, Christian endeavor. Um, and and uh, the opportunity to give thanks for these people. Uh, for uh, that woman who lived in a tent in La Perouse because of her love for the Aboriginal people. Um, uh, these, these people, part of that cloud of witness that can inspire, challenge, often humiliate um, my uh, paltry efforts, um, but that we might be encouraged. Um, I, I want to uh, be more encouraged to uh, tell the stories of our shared history Tell the stories of your local history. Uh, build history together with the young people uh, who are part of the ministries that you're involved in. And then, of course, let's uh, take up our part as we write future history. Uh, fascinating that what is old is new again, and so many of the problems that Francis Clark faced, um, we just have not learned. Uh, we <clears throat> face the same problems. We're pursuing the same uh, wrong uh, solutions are uh, often <clears throat> in, uh, presented that really healthily for us. Three areas of wondering <clears throat> as we think about what we might do with Francis Clark's example and the example of Christian Endeavour. Uh, the first is um, that question, are we in such a different context that really all we can do is look in the rear vision mirror and be thankful that others got to live in a different time? I'm conscious that the, the world that young people today are living in is very different to the world that I lived in in the late 1900s. That um, uh, so many of our young people, they go to school and to be a Christian, certainly in a school here in the inner north in Melbourne, is a pretty uh, toxic and uh, um, hostile experience. And so when they come to youth group, to church, 
for once a week, they get to be in a place where they can be Christian and, and relax. And we say, bring your friends to youth group. It's like, hell no. You know, um, this, is, this is my refuge. And, and my heart breaks um, uh, for, for them when I hear that. Are we in such a different age? But, <laughs> but we know that the church flourishes in times of opposition. The church flourishes when uh, we find in Christ the resources for a life of faith, faith and faithfulness, even when we may well lose our life uh, for that, um, that claim. Uh, and we find fellowship in the sufferings of Christ that somehow we might attain to the resurrection of the dead. So I get the challenge and I wonder whether we would do well to learn from Francis Clark and call young people to the sort of honourable life that Jesus calls us to, the dignity that he gives to us that we, I mean, he, he, he expects that we could take up our cross and follow him on the way that he walked. Jesus thinks that we are able to do that. He, res, he equips us with his spirit to enable us to do that. And that sort of dignifies me. And perhaps we need to dignify our young people as well. Are, are we in such a different age that the pledging, you know, is just so just so last century or the, even the century before? Um, no, just last century. Um, uh, and yet I, I love the story of uh, Mrs. Clark's burnt biscuits, that, that there was, a, there was a, an opposition to that high bar even at the time, but what I hear from Francis Clark is pushing into that dignity of young people, that, that they, can, they can do this. Let's, let's call them to this. Um, and what, what an encouragement uh, that is, an affirmation of, uh, of their agency. Really interestingly, uh, perhaps Young People's Society of Christian Endeavour is the world's greatest workaround. Because of the failure of the church and the failure of families, then we do the work around and we end up with age segregated ministry and the one eared Mickey Mouse. And, and a lot of our conversation in the church today, of course, is to dismantle that segregation that we might come back to the strengthening, strengthening of the family and of the congregation for intergenerational fellowship. What would it have been like if Francis Clark, in seeing the problem, said, I am going to commit to discipling parents and strengthening adults so that we might be that, that church. But I am reminded of that one-eared Mickey Mouse uh, article from Stuart Cumming, Cummings Bond in the 1980s when he talked about that idea that the life of the church is this sort of great big circle where you go from life, uh, from birth, you know, through to death, except for adolescence when you spin off into your own little world and Mickey Mouse is one ear. In, in his article, his problem was not so much with the spinning off onto the side. He, he sort of saw that as a, as a time that was sort of appropriate given all the complexity of adolescent life. The problem was that when young people came back into the life of the church, what they found was nothing of the intentional discipleship that they'd experienced in youth ministry. And so I, I wonder whether... Yes, there is good reason to engage families and to build intergenerational communities. But as we do that, would we learn from Christian Endeavour, not just that we would be against age segregated ministries, but we would be for intentional consecrated ministry and mission in the name of Christ for young people and, and make, make our congregations places where uh, they are not just enfolded and mixed in, and in so that we feel better, but actually given that intentional focus and energy and, um, and attention.